The Wednesday Week is sponsored by Michael Constantine Wealth Management. We bet you can't find a financial advisor closer to Hillsborough Stadium. Okay, uh, good evening and welcome to another Lockdown Live with Sheffield Wednesday. Now, all your greatest fears have been uh, realised all at once. It's just me today uh, interviewing one of one of our better ex-players uh, from back in the day. So for this next hour, this is the Dan Fudge Show. But also, as you can see next to me, ladies and gentlemen, is uh, one, of, one, one of the uh, countrymen of uh, good-looking people, uh, decent World Cup runs, and £13 a pint, Swedish international and ex-Sheffield Wednesday and Everton winger. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Nicholas Alexanderson, Nick, thanks a lot for joining us today, sir. Thank you for having me. My pleasure, my pleasure. I'm also a little bit annoyed that uh, you're a good 10 years older than me and you look a lot better than I do. So uh, having having expensive beer in your country must um, must really help you out keeping in the shape you have, yes? Yeah, or maybe the cold. You know, if you put things in the freezer, they, they keep good uh, longer time, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll bear that in mind going forward. Uh, yeah. Now, wh where are you right now, Nick? Uh, at the moment, I'm, uh, I'm still at work um, in Gothenburg. Uh, I work in a, in a school, um, in a football school uh, associated to IFK Gothenburg. And... Um, I'm one of the football coaches, or the, the head coach, so to speak, um, and we have about 300 uh, students, um, all having uh, football three times a week schedule in the, yeah, together with uh, their other subjects. That's, uh, that's probably why uh, Sweden has such a rich history in football then, given that these uh, these uh, establishments exist. Now, Nick, I, I wanted to, normally during, during these interviews, we go back to, to the start of your career and uh, and, and we'll, we'll work our way to get to Sheffield Wednesday at some point. Um, but, I, I want, you know, Gothenburg is is a, a club close to your close to your heart. You know what I mean? You, you spent a lot of time there. Uh, but that's not where you started out. And you come from a bit of a football family as well, am I, am I right? Yeah, that's uh, correct. Um, um, from the beginning, I, I was raised uh, in, a, in a small village um, about an hour south of Gothenburg called Vesigebru. Um, I started my uh, football ca career there in the local team, uh, get into the first team in the, in the very low divisions uh, when I was 14-15. And then when I was um, about 16, 16 and a half, I joined uh, Halmstad uh, in the Swedish Premiership um, and uh, stayed there uh, for seven seasons. And then uh, I came to Gothenburg for, for the first uh, time. Seven seasons is quite a significant amount, <laughs> amount of time in order to, to cut your teeth. Did you feel that you got your chance pretty late when you got to Gothenburg? Because obviously Gothenburg's a huge team. And, you know, getting there, how, how old were you then? Probably 23, 24? Uh, yeah, I was about 24, yeah, 20, uh, 24 or 25 when I, I joined uh, Gothenburg. And uh, at the time, that was just before the, the Bosman rule came. So mm -hmm. at the time, it was easier to, to keep the players in the Swedish league a bit longer. So when I uh, joined Gothenburg... Uh, we almost had uh, international players in every position. Uh, I came to the club uh, along with uh, Andreas Andersson, uh, who then played for AC Milan and Newcastle, and uh, Teddy Lucic, who also played in, in Italy and uh, in England. So at that time, it was, it was still possible for Gothenburg to, to sign international players within the country. Um, but I, yeah, I had uh, some good years uh, in Halmstad, which is a bit, yeah, a smaller club. And it was good as a youngster and a bit, maybe a bit easier to, to get into the first team than it was in, uh, yeah, uh, when you played for Gothenburg. Yeah, make yourself look like a, uh, a big fish in a little pond, as we say over here. So so when you got to Gothenburg, when you got there then, there, were, there, were, there would have been some large names working there. How hard did you have to work to get into the team? I mean, did you feel it quite easy or did you really have to craft? Um, well, I, I was an international at the time. So, yeah. I, I mean, I had uh, some kind of status when, 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 I, uh, when I came there. Uh, but uh, as I said, having almost international players in all positions, it, it was... Uh, 
yeah, it, it was still tough. Uh, you know, you had to, to perform, to, to play every week. Uh, uh, they had some characters like with the goalkeeper Ravelli and uh, uh, Joachim Björklund, Håkan Mild, uh, Stefan Pettersson who played for Ajax and Jesper Blomqvist. So, mm. And they, they had won uh, the Swedish league uh, three times or four times in a row when I signed. So wow. it, it was uh, a bit more pressure uh, at the time uh, it was the by far the, the the biggest club in sweden now that's interesting you said that actually because i was i was gonna i was gonna get to something that i uh, that i i have a bit of a confession to make to you nick so uh, back in 2017 my uh, my girlfriend decided she was gonna go on a, a hendu so while she was out there i ran off and went on a weekend away in copenhagen and uh I, we went to Copenhagen, and I, for those of you that, that don't know, there's a bridge called the Orishund, Orishund Bridge that goes between uh, Denmark yeah. and Sweden. And we went into Sweden, and I went to go and watch. What I didn't know at the time was a really tasty rivalry between Malmo and Gothenburg. This is this is a really big rivalry. For, for those in, in the UK, it's very much like uh, Liverpool and Manchester United. You know, this is, they're not, the, it's not a derby, but it's a really tasty rivalry. I mean, my apologies in advance, Nick, but I did buy this uh, when I was there. <laughs> uh, but that was the home team. I was in the club shop and I spent a load of money. Uh, so, um, Obviously, you know we'll, we'll get on to derbies because I, I did. You ever play in a Sheffield derby? I don't. I don't think you did. Did you? Because they were they uh, weren't no, very good at the time. Uh, really. At that time, uh, it was the right Sheffield team that was in the in the <laughs> higher league. <laughs> and uh, yeah, no. So I, I never played the derby. No, I didn't. Fair enough. But those, but those Malmo. Uh, rival the, the 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 rivalry you have with Malmo and Gothenburg, I wasn't ready for it when I think um, I think Malmo won that day, but um, the the fireworks and the and the way the stadium moved up, I wasn't ready for that. I, I uh, you know, do you ever feel that having a, a rivalry and and the, and the players that you just listed then, the the really good players, do you feel that the Swedish league standard has dropped since the Bosman rule has come in? Yeah, I think you have to say that. Uh... Now, um, they, young players tend to go abroad a lot earlier than, than they did before. Uh, before the Bosman rule, you almost had to have international experience to, to, to be signed abroad. Uh, um, now, they go, I mean, even when they're under 18, they, they sign many young, talented Swedish uh, players. Uh, it started to, to to get a little bit better now. I mean, especially with the situation with the COVID uh, thing now. Uh, mm -hmm. And I all, I mean, the ranking of the Swedish league isn't that high, but I think um, the, the the crowds and the atmosphere in the grounds are are very good. I have to say so. I think. Now, lately, there's been a lot of players, you know, older players uh, coming back to the league. And that's what they try to do in Gothenburg again now, having some players that have been abroad for five to ten years and then mix uh, them with uh, the young players coming up from the academy. Yeah, I think that, that's the way it has to. I mean, wh while you're having your maybe best year uh, of your career, then you might be abroad, but if you can can stay maybe for a bit longer when you're young and then come back and finish off, I think that's that's probably the way to do it to 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 keep the standard as high as possible in the Swedish league. But in terms in terms of the international, I mean, you've you've now got your big players playing elsewhere in Europe. You know, most notably, you've got Zlatan Ibrahimovic, who's, who's played his career across everywhere in Europe. That. That seems to be not in Sweden. <laughs> you know, you know what I mean. Uh, so, um, like, do, in terms of the international setup and the international scene, you, you got in there quite early. You know, you 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 were quite a um, a young pretender, as it were. But obviously, you know, don't get me wrong. You got in there on your talents and your merits. Were there any players that you saw at the time? Did you ever feel overwhelmed as a young man going into this dressing room with you know putting on that iconic yellow shirt? And going, wow! Look at me! Look at these players that I'm rubbing shoulders with. Or did you feel I belong here? No, I think I mean when you're there for the first time. I I made my debut um, 
in the end of 93. So, so I were one of the pretenders uh, to take a place in the World Cup squad for 94. Uh, I got injured a bit in the winter, so I, I struggled to find my best form uh, uh, before the Swedish league started. And then, uh, so I just missed out, which was a pity because, uh, you know, they, Sweden finished f uh, third in that uh, World Cup. And that's, yeah. Uh, Except from the 58 uh, silver medal, uh, it's the best World Cup uh, by far by a Swedish team. So, a and we had some players in, in that World Cup that, I mean, when I came into the team, like Thomas Brolin and uh, Martin Dallin and Jonas Turn and Stefan Schwartz and so on. So, of course, when, when you when you come into the national team the first time, you you... It takes a few uh, games before you, you feel 100% uncom uh, comfortable there. So let's uh, let's talk about then coming over to England, because you mentioned Thomas Brolin there, for example, who didn't have a great time uh, with uh, with our neighbours, Leeds United. And uh, and I'd be, I'd be doing a disservice to probably the Sheffield Wednesday fans listening to this, not to ask you about Roland Nilsson and if he had any kind of influence on your decision to choose Sheffield? Did you have offers from any other clubs? I mean, you know, did, or, or was he just somebody that you just happened to meet in a changing room in Sweden? Um, well, as I remember it, it's, it's quite a long time ago, but uh, at the time um, we played in the Champions League uh, with IFK. So I know, I mean, that's a good uh, way of yeah, showing your abilities uh, for other clubs uh, mm -hmm. rather than just playing uh, domestic games. Um, so I had some good games in the Champions League uh, for IFK. So I know there were some some clubs abroad that were interested. Uh, I remember there were especially one club from Italy that was very interested. But then it all happened very quickly. My, my agent uh, phoned me one day, uh, beginning of December 97, and uh, told me now I've got this club, Sheffield Wednesday, that's interested and they want uh, us to come over. Uh, and I had sort of one, two days uh, only to, to decide. And uh, and I remember uh, phoning uh, up Roland Nilsson since, since I know he had had a good... Uh, very good time at the club. Um, oh, he's, he's he's one of our heroes, to be fair. <laughs> yeah, I know, I, I I know, I know very well. So, uh, yeah, and he, of course, he had only good things to to say about the club. So, I flew out over with my agent, and um, yeah, flew to Manchester, took the the cab over to Sheffield, and I remember being a bit, oh, this looks like Sweden with all, you know, passing the Peak District with uh, all the, the hills and, uh, and that. So, yeah, and I, I, I felt straight away this, this feels like a very, yeah, for me, it was important. I mean, it's a big step coming from Sweden over to, to a big league like the Premier League. So, yeah, I think it's important that, yeah, it, it's sort of the right size of the club. Uh, and for me at the time, I felt uh, Sheffield Wednesday had all that uh, that I was looking looking for. I mean, so, I mean, the, the size of the stadium and, and the fan base and, and all the rest of it. Did you yeah. did you find a difference in the way that uh, I, I travel to Europe a lot to different countries to see how they support football? It's a bit of a weird little thing I do. And... I was very happy. Sweden's really good. It reminds me of that lower league German stuff where you, you, in England, we are, ha, 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 we've got one over you. You know what I mean? We beat you. Whereas in Sweden and, and in some parts of Europe, it's blindly just cheering on your own team. You know what I mean? Like, I am going to sing about this team for 90 minutes. And then you have the guy on the on the stand who stands there with the uh, with the megaphone and leads the chants. I, I thought that was incredible. So sometimes, you know, did you, did you notice that on the pitch when you got on there early? Yeah, <laughs> I have to say, when I, back in the days, when I played for the first time in the Swedish league, we didn't have that big crowds and the atmosphere wasn't as it has been. I mean, 
Uh, nowadays, I feel it's almost a better atmosphere in Sweden than it is in the Premier League. I mean, it, it tends to, especially the big clubs in, uh, in mm. uh, the Premier League now, they, it's a lot of foreign supporters. Uh, uh, it, it has become more expensive to go to football. So, and, you know, with the sitting crowd. Uh, uh, so nowadays, I feel if you go to one of the big uh, games, Games in Sweden, you can get really good atmosphere. Uh, mm -hmm. And now I speak pre-COVID, of course, but uh, um, but at the time it it was uh, it was a big change, and I I felt that Sheffield Wednesday was one of the clubs that had the, the best support. Uh, to be fair, uh, you know, with that uh, band uh, playing and, and singing in the game. So I, I remember, you know. It was never hard to, to sort of be up for the games. Once you you came out the tunnel and run on the pitch, you automatically get that uh, yeah that feeling. Oh, now it's it, it's time to 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 perform. So and yeah. the adren adrenaline went going once you just when when you came on the pitch. I can imagine. I can imagine. Now, you know, you during the 90s as a as a Sheffield Wednesday fan, it was it was one of our most successful periods. And uh, and you can break the 90s up into three periods of, of which were my personal favourites. You've got the early 90s, the League Cup win, and then the uh, the Cup final year in 93. And then the 98 era was the most exciting time to watch Sheffield Wednesday because it was insane. We had Benito Carboni and Paolo Di Cagno like rubbing shoulders alongside with what you'd refer to as industrial players like Peter Atherton and Mark Pembridge. It was absolutely incredible. It was, it was mental, this whole thing. And so when you came in and you saw this, how did you, how did you see this club? Did you sit and think, what, what the hell have I walked into here? Uh, well, uh, I, I think first of all, uh, as a Swede, it, it's not too difficult to, to adapt to the, you know, the English way. I mean, mm -hmm. We're probably seen quite a lot like the English, we like more the hardworking. Uh, and then you had, um, you know, the, as you said, the, the likes of Carboni and uh, Di Canio. And, you know, the, you never really know uh, for sure what would happen both in the dressing room and on the pitch. I mean, they, they could do a bit more of the, the unexpected things. Um, but uh, I, I mean, it was a great mix. It, it's fun to to be in an ev environment that's uh, you know have a bit of of both. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, I think when I joined Wednesday, obviously they were were struggling uh, uh, already. Then um, uh, I think it was just when when Big Ron took over. Uh, so I think when when I joined, uh, we were, yeah, bottom of the of the table. Yeah, I think I think we already were at this point. So you mentioned Big Ron, you know, uh, a, a, a mainstay during most of those eras that I mentioned previously. What is he like as a person? Because we've had, you know, we had John Newsom on before talk about uh, how his difficult side. And how about how sometimes he can be a bit belligerent and, and a bit argumentative and uh, how they wanted to kick him really hard in training. Uh, did he still do that five years later in uh, in 1998? Was that something he still did? Did he join in the training sessions? Yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. I remember he, he did. Uh, he was probably not moving <laughs> that much. <laughs> but uh, I, I think he, he was the kind of... Per I mean, either you... you you liked him or you hated him, maybe. Uh, but uh, for me personally, I mean, I came into the team. I remember going to the away games. He can, he, he could call you and Niklas, come here and sit in the front uh, of the coach, and uh, and he, and he could start uh, talk about you know some Swedish players I've played with, and he, he knew, knew know a lot about uh, different things and. Uh, so it, it was never boring with him around. Uh, I mean, uh, there could be almost fights uh, sometimes with the, with the, you know, the guys with a really strong character when they... When Are you being really did. polite there, Nicholas? Because yeah. there, is, there is a point that Paolo Di Canio mentions in his book about where I think somebody took their jacket off and somebody went tearing in on. So yeah. were you there for that? Yeah, I mean, uh, there were probably not hits, but, but it was close and... Uh, <laughs> 
Uh, I remember, uh, especially once where, where uh, Paolo and, and uh, Big Ron had a big argue, argument. I think it was before, maybe it was Easter or something. We, we, we played at home and then two days later we were going to play against Leeds away and Paolo stormed off and then... Uh, yeah, uh, and the match day he came up to, and then it was fine. So, but but uh, yeah, it was some great characters, I have to say. I was going to say, so you know, everybody will probably always the Sheffield Wednesday fans specifically will ask you about Paolo and how hard he trained and all the rest of it. Was there anybody else in the squad that we would be surprised to know that this guy was? was great fun to be around for example you know like lee briscoe was great fun or you know mark pembridge had a really big gambling addiction or something like that you know just an example is there Ooh. who was who your mate in the team well obviously uh, not surprisingly maybe petty rudy um mm -hmm. since uh, we, yeah we speak almost the same lang language and he was mm -hmm. there by by his own so he almost lived uh, with me and my wife for a while as we <laughs> spent a lot of time together and he joined I think just a month or something before me so he could show I mean show me a lot how it worked and then uh, during my my spell at Wednesday it, it tends to I think because you're in the same situation as the other foreigners it, it's easy to I remember spending quite a lot of time with uh, Juan Cobian when he was there mm -hmm. and also Emerson Tome and uh, Wim Jonk. Wow. Uh, and then also I spent some time with uh, Simon Donnelly and, uh, and uh, Phil O'Donnell, who, who suddenly isn't with us anymore. We, um, we did have Simon, uh, Simon Donnelly on the show and uh, he was talking about his time with Sheffield Wednesday. And he said... You know, look at the players that you've just listed there. You know, you've got you've got Dicanio, Emerson Tome, Vim Yonk, who who was world class at that point. I mean, we as Wednesday fans thought, well, how the hell have we signed this guy? You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and Petter Rudy, I mean, when on Petter Rudy on his day, in terms of threading balls through through that, it was absolutely incredible. But we'd flank them with people like Danny Sonner, for example, who who just didn't seem to have the same class. And no disrespect to him, he's still a very good footballer at the time. Don't get me wrong. Um, did you ever stop and think, look at the players we have in this changing room? How how are we doing so rubbish? Well, uh, yeah, of course. I mean, you you always want to do better, and and just looking at the players, maybe we could could have done. But it's not all about the individuals. You, you need to get everything together as a group. Uh, uh, and maybe it was the consistency. I mean, we. It was first uh, Peter Shreves and then Big Ron and then we had uh, Danny Wilson and maybe maybe we didn't just find the right way and I mean it was different qualities uh, that we had but maybe we didn't quite get it together as as a team. Did and, you? Uh... And still, even at that time, I mean, you had the big club like I remember Man U for example, the team they had. I mean, yeah. Compared to, to our team, it, it it was still a bit different class, but uh, on well, on, uh, on our day we could beat them. Absolutely, lad. That's what I was going to say. Let's uh, let's talk about Manchester United because the team that they had, there was a specific day at Hillsborough, and I was what I was about eighteen years old. It was very much during my season ticket years, and it it didn't sink in until about ten o'clock that evening. You know when you go, we absolutely battered them. I mean, this day. That you had, must have been your best day in a Sheffield Wednesday shirt, right? Yeah, of course. That, that's uh, my single best moment, of course, and one of the yeah best uh, memories. Uh, even if it's all all football games I've played, that it's up there with the top three probably. And to beat a team like Man U as they were at the time, and then to to score two, and I think I was involved in the third one as well so and I'd also just I think this was November 98 and I had been out with my cruciate um, ligament injury from January till September so just coming back and then to have that game that close uh, to my injury uh, it was just great I remember Jesper Blomqvist was in the United team at the mm -hmm. time and we had decided before the game that he was going to stay over and we were going to go out for a meal. So 
uh, yeah, it was a good evening. <laughs> did that still happen? Did you still do that meal? Yeah, did, we still oh, did yeah. that. Yeah, bless I it. Think, he... I mean, he could probably take it. They they won quite a lot anyway. So. <laughs> yeah, I think one day is going to be okay. But yeah. I think he he actually missed a bit of a sitter. I remember. There was one where he come in and he cut back and I think he went for a chip over Pavel Cernicek and chipped it over the goal. He didn't yeah. didn't quite float it in. However, you yourself uh, managed to smash one through what was one of the world's greatest goalkeeper's hands and left him sprawling in the back of his own net. Yeah, I, I think he, he would probably think himself that he would uh, save that 99 times out of 100. But uh, yeah, this time was my lucky day. Absolutely, absolutely. If I, if if anything, when you look back, I mean, the, the, for that, for the second goal you scored that day, the way the ball broke, there must have been a point where you were running towards that ball, thinking, "How has this got to me here?" You know, I'm in, I'm in the Manchester United, about twelve yards away from goal, with nobody in front of me. I mean, I mean, yeah. wow, that that's that's a lucky day, isn't it, Nick? Yeah, it was, and it was a bit like like. Uh... The England goal as well, where it just dropped in front of me, and it was also mm. also the left foot I used. So yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. For a predominantly right footed player, and that that goal. Let's let's talk about England, and let's talk about uh, about Sweden. We seem to, as as a nation, we seem to play Sweden a lot. Uh, I, I don't know why you always seem to end up in our groups, or we end up in your group, and you know, and there's been some there's been some absolute ding dong battles with. Uh, with Sweden uh, from an England perspective, but I'd love to know it from your perspective. I always, um, I always like asking opposing teams, whether it be at club or international level, what your perception of the other team would be. So, for example, you know, it's uh, it's the early two thousands. This isn't it. It's around two thousand two in the uh, in the south. What is it? South South Korea. Yeah, we played. Uh, this game was in Japan. Japan. Uh, uh, in in Saitama, yeah. Okay, so the ball's broke to you. You've cut inside and you've smashed it in. But before that game, were you thinking, "Who am I up against?" Because you'd have been up against Ashley Cole probably at that game, or was it was that was that the day, or or who yeah, who, who do I need to yeah. watch out for yeah. at, at this at this time? What was your perception of the England team then? Because to us, it was one of the greatest ones we've had in years. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I've played, as you said, I've played against England a lot in, in different competitions, mm -hmm. both qualifiers and uh, in the, yeah, 2002 and also in the 2006. Mm -hmm. um, and for us, I mean, in Sweden, we, we're brought up with English football. Uh, Saturdays, you know, they had a program always in Sweden where they showed a game and you had like your coupons where you where you bet and things like that. So uh, English football is the most, by far the most popular uh, in, in Sweden. And uh, I mean, we, we've always, when I remember it from when I played, I mean, when, when you look to, into the English team, if you looked player by player, it wasn't a question of which team who had the better players. But we knew being the underdog suited us really well. And for some reason, we, we know that we always performed quite well against England. I think out of the competitive games I've played against them, probably not lost any. It's been a draw uh, almost every time. Um, so I think we, we could go out, out there without any pressure, really, and just try to 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 yeah play the best we could. And, and we knew that as a team, if we do it together, we, we could beat this team, even though they individually have better players in most positions. What are the, uh, what are the expectations of the uh, Swedish national team? So, for example... In this country, you've been in this country, you've witnessed it. We seem to think that we are going to win every World Cup that we're in. And we always get our expectations up and we go, we spend three years going, ah, it's gone, we're never going to win it again, it's gone. And then about six months before the tournament, it's coming home, it's coming home, this is happening, we're going to, we're going to win all the football. Do you have still that, do you have that in Sweden or are you guys like, hey, you know, quarterfinals, semifinals, you, do you set your, it's a very pragmatic country. Do you set your expectations pragmatically is I guess what I'm asking. I would say that the expectations, they tend to change. Um, 
when we had, I mainly played in the national team under Lars Lagerbeck and um, yeah, and then he had some some different uh, assistant coaches. But during his time with the national team, Sweden qualified for uh, five straight um, championships. And normally, for for a, for a country of Sweden's size and the, the amount of players uh, we have, I would say that's a that's a really good achievement just yes, to to be in five consecutive uh, championships. But one and uh, but once we we were there, then first our first target used to be to 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 get through the group stages, which mm -hmm. we did by a number of occasions. But then afterwards, people start. Once you've done that a few times, after a while, ah, we can we can get there. We can go through. But then it's it's we should we should be higher up. We should go at least to the semi-final. So I think that's once you you start. I mean, people back home once. You, once it, it got into a habit to to just be there, then they they ex, the expectations uh, rise. It's a, I think there's worse problems to have there. To be fair, Nick, I mean we are have it. We're the other way around. We have no expectation. Then we and then we just build it up, and then we it's yeah. completely unfounded. You know, what I mean, we've got nowhere near a World Cup final. In, in, well, apart from 2018, we, you know, between nine, in about 18 years, there was a, there was a point where we got nowhere near it, but we were still going to win it every year. We decided that. So um, let's go back to uh, to Sheffield Wednesday, and uh, we had Matt Hanshaw uh, on on the on the show uh, not so long back, and. Uh, and he said it was uh, it was very difficult under Danny Wilson for and the, rather than Big Ron in terms of the atmosphere around the place, and uh, and he also said that somebody had divided the changing rooms into two at the I want to say at the training ground. Uh, did you did you did you feel an atmosphere of of, of how the club was when you were there? Uh, uh... I mean, you don't have to be polite, you know. I mean, we, we yeah, know we no, we, it wasn't uh, the greatest <laughs> era that we were in. Maybe I would say, I mean, maybe I was a bit more in the middle, so to speak. I, I think there was, I mean, differences between between maybe the the South Europeans and the, and the British ones in terms of uh, how you see things and. The way you play and everything, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I, I could probably be on on either side. For for me, I was so I, I maybe didn't feel it as strongly as if you are if you ask a, a British player or if you ask a Europe South European player, maybe they felt the differences more. Uh, for me, uh, for 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 me, it was fine uh, to to be either way, but. It was probably a bit. Uh, there's the foreigners. There's the, the the British ones. I would say. Okay. So, do you looking back on that era? Then you must have some great stories. You must have some some great anecdotes of you know. I don't know. Did you burn somebody's clothes in the shower? Did you uh, did you get your clothes burned in the shower or, or anything like this? Uh... Well, I, I remember we, we always had that kind of uh, fashion show, you know, with uh, I know the British players always thought, uh, yeah, Italians especially, and even myself sometimes that, uh, you know, we were a bit too fancy maybe. So it was popular. I think I remember Mark Pembridge, you know, doing the catwalks with the... Uh, with uh, the clothes, uh, <laughs> and they put it up in the in the ceilings and things like that. So, <laughs> did yeah. you, as as a European, do do you understand that level of? I mean, we refer to it as banter in this country, where sometimes it can be a bit mean. But we go, hey, we're only having a laugh. It's okay. I mean, you must have yeah, understood I, this at the time, yeah, right? I, I thought it was mainly having a laugh. I I never, you know, took it uh, badly or or anything like that. But uh, yeah, it was quite many years, so so I, I probably forgotten most uh, most of the things. I remember uh, my next club. I had some some players around that uh, it was never, you know, like. Gaston. Tell us about it. Tell us about it. So this is Everton. You moved to Everton in two thousand uh, uh, for what was it? Two and a half two, million pounds. Uh, yeah, something like that. And yeah. we, uh, I don't, I don't think uh, we ever saw that money 
So, you know, we appreciate you getting it, but I don't think we got it at the club at this point. Yeah, but... I think you do. I think you did. I, I was probably one of the players that you actually gained some money from. On. Yeah. <laughs> We don't get many. Uh, no, but I mean, having Gassa around in, in the dressing room was... was. Uh, oh, God, yeah, of course, you had Gas going at this yeah, point. Yeah. I, I mean, mean, what was he, he like? Did, yeah, I mean, you've probably seen some uh, some clips, uh, you know, on the internet, like when Gino Lard joined, when he ran out with a wig, uh, you know, and things like that. And remember people doing interviews and he could be upstairs with a bucket of uh, water and uh, yeah it, it was never it was never boring I, I, I can imagine was he I mean obviously we, we know about Gascoigne and, he, and his mental health issues that, that he had and, it, and, it, and it's, it's such a sad story but as a footballer he was one of the most naturally gifted people we've ever seen in this country right yeah I mean we joined at the same time, so um, maybe he was a bit past his best uh, then. You could see, I mean, glimpse of his quality in the games. Maybe he couldn't perform it, you know, on a consistent level, but uh, you could see it, uh, you know, his touch and everything. And uh, I also felt, you know, when I was there that... Uh, you often hear about, you know, the the, the backside or his, the problem he's got. But I, I thought he, he was a person with a really big heart as well. With uh, which, uh, yeah, he was uh, he was really, you know, helpful and uh, friendly and everything. I, I, there is a um, I don't know if you've seen it on social media. There is a clip circulating of him on the uh, the Italian version of Love Island, I believe, where he just seems to be dancing down a uh, a catwalk for some reason. But he seems to be living his best life right now. All let's right. hope he's, yeah, uh, that's good. I hope he's okay. Yeah, let's hope he's getting better. Um, I, I wanted to ask you uh, about um, about the club un under Danny Wilson. Uh, were you were you there long for that? Was that something you were there for a lot of? Trying uh, to get a sense of the timeline. Uh, he, I mean, I, I got injured. I, I signed and then I only played about 10 games. And then I got injured in, in January when uh, Big Ronsville was the manager. And then after saving the contract, uh, Danny Wilson uh, took over in the summer. So for me, that was a bit, okay, I've been, I've only been, played 10 games for the clubs and then I've been out for six, seven months. I, I didn't know how that would affect my chances of, of getting back in the team, but uh, he showed a uh, great belief in me straight from the start. So I, as soon as I was fit enough, I got back into the team like in September. Um, obviously, we, we were we were struggling to, to you know, to... to to lift our level, that, yeah, was, that, was, that, that was that something that that he was responsible for a little bit? Because obviously you've got uh, a character uh, in Big Ron, who's a people manager, uh, and what was the difference between the two? I, I think it, it's never one person's uh, fault that uh, you mm. never. Get, I mean, it's it's a mix of you know the players, the the settings, the manager. Uh, it, it's success is about getting every everyone. Uh, pulling the same way and uh, um, I mean Big Ron was more of a I mean he, he, he took his place you know you, you could always feel he, he was in the center of things Danny Wilson was a bit more low-key I, I felt uh, I, I still feel maybe that the it was still a bit of the, so to speak, uh, the, the old school kind of managing uh, things. It, it started to change maybe the, the, the last year of my career. It was still, you know, a lot of five sides and things. And, you know, the, I was a bit surprised when I joined from Sweden uh, how, how little uh, we were training. Uh, and I think that was the same for the Italians. I mean, sometimes it was like three, four times a week and... Uh, you know, five asides and things, and that started to change uh, my, my last year in England. I, I think uh, also with the with the foreign managers coming in and, and so on. Yeah, the um, we were not very good at keeping up to date with it. So if you look, there's an era of players who were naturally gifted in the mid '90s and never really kicked on to be world beaters. 
because we didn't embrace in this country quick enough the the dietitians the uh, the level of training the the fitness side of the game uh you know notably people Gascoigne's a great example um also people like Paul Merson at Arsenal pe people like that and so when players like in the mid 90s you got Ginola um you got a, Ar Arsenal they they got an influx of French players didn't they and 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 that I, I kind of like Wenger ch changed the game a little bit. He was one of the pioneers of this of this new way of thinking. So were we a bit late to the game at that at Sheffield Wednesday? Uh, I don't think it was just Sheffield Wednesday. I think it was it was maybe a bit more all, all over. But uh, um, I, I was a bit surprised. In one way, I like it. You know, it, it didn't matter. You had, you know, the older players that... Yeah, they were, weren't maybe fit enough to train in the week, but then they could still go out and be among the best players on the Saturday. And for me, that's what it's all about. You need to perform, but in the long run, maybe it's not possible to keep up. I mean, then you need the, the training as well to, to, to get your fitness level. And if you're in, in the last few years of your career, you can do it. Like I remember Des Walker, I mean, he, he could uh, go weeks without training and he was still, uh, you know, do, doing the same uh, good job uh, in the game. So, uh, um, but I think, you know, for the younger players and to, to develop and, and um, yeah, the, the way that the, the game is today, I think you, you, you need to look after your fitness and health and preparations more than we did at the time. Mm -hmm. Did you, uh, I mean, you know, given on what you've just said then, a, a player that springs to mind is David Erst. I mean, you, I don't think you overlapped at the club for very long, did you? Uh, no, I never played with him at all. Uh, I, yeah. I think it, it, I, I think. think his last season he was at Southampton and there was a, there was uh, a lonely, so I don't yeah. think you ever really caught him. So did you feel that that name and 1991 and this team, do, do you feel that kind of hovers over the... A lot like we talk about 1966 World Cup, it kind of hovers over the team a little bit. Do you feel like you were constantly chasing those shadows, especially with Big Ron in charge as well, who was in yeah, charge then? I think it's always like that. If, you, if you've been a club which have had success during a spell, like yeah, when Roland Nilsson was there, and then it was a bit the same for me coming to Everton. I mean, they were had some great times in the 80s, and then, you know, you tend to always look back. It's the same in, in Gothenburg at the moment. Uh, keep looking back, you know, to, to when we had those, uh, yeah, great players and, and uh, success winning titles and that. So sometimes that can haunt you a little bit. Uh, and I guess it's worst for the for the supporters. I mean, the, you get the frustrations. You know, you've been there before, and you want to get back. And I can imagine today it's it's by far, yeah, even worse. So have you uh, have you managed to keep up with anything that's happening at Sheffield Wednesday or even Everton? Uh, well, I, I always uh, look out for the results. Uh, it's been a bit more difficult to follow now, uh, but uh, uh, it was a while since since I saw Wednesday play live. But but I, I keep an eye on the you know the league position and uh, how it goes in the game. So and uh, I suffer as much as all the other Wednesday supporters, and uh, yeah, and hope uh, the times will be better soon again. Well, this is why we're doing this interview, Nicholas, because to be fair, normally we use this show to talk about football. Me and a group of the supporters, we get together and talk about the current state of affairs. So uh, we'd rather uh, remember when you were playing for the club, when, you know, I would snap your hand off for 1998 Sheffield Wednesday right now. You know, you know what yeah. I mean? Um, but yeah, so uh, I, I did ask uh, a couple of people, you know, uh, some, some questions that they wanted to ask you. Um, and one of you know, who are you? Get out of my house. There was a couple of them, but then there was uh, there was there was one about about Roland Nilsson, and then there was uh, there was another one. If I could if I could find it now, my apologies. Um, why did you break his heart? Yeah, Anthony wants to know why did you break his heart and go to Everton? Uh, <laughs> but well, I don't well, think you had much to do with that, did you? No, the, the thing was, I mean. Uh, if I look at it from my point of view, um, 
when we were relegated, I had one year left of my contract. So it, it was uh, uh, for the club, uh, either they needed to sell me to get mm. money. Uh, if it otherwise, of course, I'd needed to, to sign a new contract. But for me, having the, you know, the championships uh, and to keep my uh, place in the Swedish national team, I, I had to, to play in the premiership, I felt. So, uh, I mean, I would have loved to, to stay at Wednesday in the Premier League, but and I did my, my very best. I, 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 at least I feel I, I did the best I could to... To, to help Wednesday stay up. Unfortunately, we, we didn't. But uh, yeah, at the time we had the Euro 2000 in the summer and then the World uh, Cup qualifiers coming up. So in terms of keeping my international uh, place, I, I had to play, play in the Premier League. Especially how it went for Sheffield Wednesday in the first couple of seasons in the Championship as well. I think that was, that yeah. was pretty much a sensible decision to make. Um, Fans, who's the you know got to, and I, let's take Gothenburg out of this, let's take IFK out of this situation. Everton and Sheffield Wednesday, we're the better set of fans, aren't we? Right? Will there be any Everton fans listening to this show? No, they won't know. <laughs> so, yeah, you're allowed to say, it, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, uh, first of all, I, I really enjoyed. Uh, Basically, every club I've played for, uh, I'm, I'm extremely grateful for, for Wednesday in many ways because, yeah, for me, it was a big step to, to as I said, to come to the Premiership. And I felt uh, really welcomed both from the club but also from the supporters. And uh, since I maybe it, ironic enough, I probably had my best season the, the personally the year we were relegated and mm. and uh, gratefully got the fans players of the year award. So, uh, mm. I mean, I will always have a, a special place for the for the Wednesday uh, supporters and and also you know atmosphere wise with the band playing, I, I thought it was often great atmosphere at Hillsborough. It's it, it, it when it's going well, it's the best I've ever been around. When it's not going so well, it, it can be awful. Do you feel that on the pitch? You know, when it goes really toxic. Yeah, I mean, uh, I didn't really have a, a spell like that uh, at Wednesday when when I joined Everton. It started off really well, but then I I lost uh, my form and didn't perform as as near as I know I could uh, and. Once you're in a, in a spell like that, you tend to, you know, you can hear if you do, you know yourself if you do, yeah, bad things. But uh, if you hear it, you tend to hear them more when when uh, when, when you're not I playing better. well. I mean, when 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 you play well, you don't think as much. You just you just go and you don't think very much. So uh, yeah, fair enough. I yeah, uh, I just need to ask you one more question about your time in England. And then, uh, and then we'll wrap this up. But I, uh, I, it completely slipped me by that you played for West Ham uh, at one point. I, uh, it was something that I'd forgotten about completely. Now, you've been in Sheffield, you've been in Liverpool with Everton, and then you, did you move to London or did you just think, you know, it's just going to be a short term? So how did yeah. you find the two different cities and the attitudes toward football? Uh, yeah, and, and I never. Uh, West Ham was just alone for just over a month, so I, I had my family up uh, north and uh, just stayed in a hotel uh, during the time. So I can't compare the two of them. Um, well, uh, I never lived. I lived uh, about thirty minutes outside Liverpool, uh, between Manchester and Liverpool. So I never lived within the city. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I enjoyed both lives and and the football in in, in both cities. Really, uh, I was grateful. I had, unfortunately, that they're not long us anymore. Uh, I had a, a man called Graham Thorpe who was in the in the board when I signed. Who, who got who was like a extra grandfather for us uh, living in the door. We. Uh, they helped us, you know, with a lot of the things around the club. And I always felt it was very, you know, friendly, everything around in in, 
in Sheffield especially, and uh, still have some friends outside football from there. So, uh, so yeah, so uh, I'm grateful for both the, the the time on and off the pitch uh, that I had in Sheffield. And um, my first daughter was was born in the old uh, hospital as well in Sheffield. So. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. So I, my apologies if they have our accent. I, I assume they don't, but I, I bet every now and again, I, you know, I live in the South now and there's a few words that give me away in its words. Instead of make, break and take, I say make, break and tech. And yeah. my apologies about that. I'm, I'm, I'm making no apologies if I'm honest. Um, did you ever play in a Liverpool derby? You must have done. Yeah, I played in a few. But they were mental, weren't they? Yeah, they were they were really tough. I remember, you know, uh, sometimes you, especially Everton, maybe being the underdog a little bit. Uh, sometimes we put up like six defenders in the starting eleven, yes, because the, the gaffer know it would be a, you know, more of a war than a football game, maybe. But uh, <laughs> unfortunately, I, I never came up on top in any of the the Liverpool derbies. So that was yeah. Tough. Yeah, I think uh, I think I think they, Liverpool enjoyed a, a better a better era uh, at that time, didn't they? Rather than rather than yeah. Everton. Well, Nicholas, at least I scored one uh, playing for Wednesday against Liverpool. So. Well, yes, you did. <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? That's uh, yeah. uh, you got your bag one there, and and yeah. that one's more important, if I'm honest. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Scoring against Liverpool and scoring against Manchester United in a what can be described as a, a struggling Sheffield Wednesday team. That's that's not a bad little record, Nick. To be no, fair. That's... That's okay. Nick, <laughs> uh, thank you so much for joining us. I really, really appreciate your time. Um, join us next time on, I think we're probably going to do a podcast on Saturday, where we're going to be talking about the current plight of Sheffield Wednesday. Thanks a lot to Mike Constantine, uh, Wealth Management, for sponsoring this. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, once again, Nicholas Alexanderson. Thank you. The Wednesday Week is sponsored by Michael Constantine, Wealth Management. We bet you can't find a financial advisor closer to Hillsborough Stadium.